JHK here for the All-Star, and join me right now from Southern Florida is UFC featherweight Charles Rosa, Boston Strong. How's everything going, man? All right, great, man. Just got back from the gym a little bit ago. Just uh, cooked up some uh, Chilean sea bass, so got some food in me, and uh, feeling good, man. Excited for tomorrow. Excited That's the one tournament. thing that is clear as day is that for training camp, you are eating better than most fighters, and you cook it all yourself. Yeah, no doubt, man. That's something I pride myself in. You know, I graduated from Johnson & Wales Culinary School, uh, majored in, you know, culinary arts and nutrition, and, um, you know, I was able to get a degree from there. And, you know, I've used, I was, I worked in a restaurant for a while and stuff like that. So that's my other passion is cooking. Uh, actually, it's my hobby now. So now it's my hobby, my passion is fighting. And, you know, uh, I'm sure as I get older, I might switch now, you know? <laughs> for sure, for sure. Before we get into um, your fight coming up, I wanted to pick your brain about, Last weekend, UFC 266, your division featherweight, Volkanovski and Ortega, they went to battle. It was an incredible fight. The third round, man, just take me through what you were watching. Were you watching it live? Oh, yeah. I watched it at my house. I watched it live, man. I was I was watching it, man. And uh, it was crazy because, like, you even said the third round. Like, the fight before that, I forget the two guys, Marlon Marais and the other guy, yeah. I was – that was the best run I've ever seen in my life. Like, that was amazing. I'm going nuts. And then, like, I find myself three fights later saying the same thing. Like, that was the best fight of my life. So, like, it was obviously a good card. A lot of good guys on it. And But that round in particular, man, like, you know, to see the uh, – was that the one with all the submission escapes? Was that the third round? When he got yeah. out of the – The yeah, two he submissions. Got out, of, got out of the guillotine. Yeah. Was, that was I honestly thought Volkanovski was I, I thought he was done like with that guillotine like I saw how deep it was and then the triangle too and on top of it you know how good Ortega is at finishing submissions like that's his specialty and he got him right where he wanted him and man you know hats off to uh, Volkanovski the guy's tough as nails and he didn't quit and that's what makes a fighter and that's what makes a champion so he did it Ortega just a phenomenal grappler a phenomenal submission artist he gets in a mounted guillotine you get an amount of guillotine does anybody get it out because i thought like you said everybody thought ortega was going to be the champion once that thing was locked in yeah i mean the thing is it's weird like the thing about submissions that are really difficult is like you don't really have to tap to them you know what i'm saying like you either your lights go out or they don't it's kind of like getting punched like there's no perfect place i mean it's different than getting punched but i mean like if someone gets you in a submission an arm bar just saying your arm pops pop but it doesn't break and the ref doesn't stop it like i've been in numerous you know i have 11 ufc fights now and i'd say in at least half of them i've popped a ligament on the other opponent and you know i've only you know tapped two guys in the ufc out of those you know six or seven fights that i've had deep submissions in like almost every ufc fight you know dennis siever i popped his knee he kept fighting through it and all these guys man that they're willing to die in there so like that's the thing like if you don't have the submission tight enough to put the guy to sleep or to break something where it's noticeable enough for the referee to see, then the fight continues if the guy doesn't want to give up. So that's something that, you know, that's that's the way. When I when I go in there to fight, like, I'm willing to die in there. So, like, I, 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 I couldn't see myself ever quitting or anything like that. But, um, you know, sometimes guys want to stay face, so it is what it is. Who else did you pop a ligament on? Oh, uh, well, I got one on De uh, Manny Bermudez, but he actually tapped, you know, and then uh, – let me think. So I fought Sean Soriano. Like, even though I submitted him, Sean Soriano, I submitted him. But uh, I got him in two arm bars before that where it's pop, pop, pop. And he just like, no, we just ate it. And I got out. And luckily, you know, I submitted him. I think it's like one of the fast, uh, latest submissions in, in the history. It was like 17 seconds left in the fight. I slept on a dar, so I was able to put him out. But, like, you know, he, he was pretty much sleeping. You know what I mean? So, like, he didn't tap to the two arm bars. And a couple other submissions I threw at him. And then if you go through the list, like this, anybody that I've been on the ground with, I've probably got him in something that, you know, at least put some damage on him. But like I said, like, it, it, it's hard to tap these guys. They, you got to be able to break it or put them to sleep. Yeah, definitely. I, I feel the same way just as a, a, a spectator, right? Just watching you guys. And yeah. I know sometimes, like, man, how did he even twist out of that? How did he even, like, squeeze out of that? And you know it's pure grit sometimes, right, in submissions. Yeah, that, there's no doubt. It's, it, uh, like I said, it's really hard to break someone's bones with your bone. It's like not like you have like a, a wedge or something like where you can push it up against the cage and snap it. Like you're trying to break it with your body, so it's really difficult. Like, you know, if you try to break someone's bone, it's not that easy. And that's usually what you got to do. I mean, chokes are a little bit easier because they go to sleep. 
But yeah, man, it's definitely difficult to break someone's bone. <laughs> Do you think uh, they should go with the trilogy, Volk and Holloway, or does the UFC they need to go another direction and and we don't need to see that fight for a third time? Well, um, I think Yair Rodriguez is fighting Holloway, and I think that's necessary. I think that you know Yair Rodriguez could be a you know if he wins that fight. I think a lot of fans would rather see that just because. But, I mean, I do think the Max, you know, Volkanovski fight was very close and deserves it. But I just, like, as me, as just a fan, too, just me watching it, like, I'd rather see, like, Yair Rodriguez versus Volkanovski or, you know, something like that. Or, like, in, if, if Volkanovski if happens to Volkanovski, like, an interim fight, you know, like, Holloway deserves a shot, no doubt. But I'd like to see, like, Yair versus Holloway for an intern if somehow he doesn't fight. But if he's healthy then, you know, obviously he's the champ, but uh, I'd say the winner of that fight gets it. You faced Yair back in the day, you know, earlier in yes. your career, and arguably you won that fight in Mexico. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you see that fight playing out? Do you see Yair having a, a really good chance of taking out Holloway, or is Holloway just at another level? I think Volkanovski would be a tougher fight for for um, for Yair. I think Yair has a very good chance against Holloway because Holloway is primarily a striker. And when have you ever seen, you know, Yair Rodriguez really just get, like, picked apart a piece apart? He always has trouble with the wrestling and stuff like that. Like, you know, I felt him on the feet, and, you know, I was able to get to him, but I had to eat a lot of shots to get to him. The guy, he's been doing Taekwondo since he was, like, a baby, you know what I'm saying? So he's on his toes, he's quick, he's fast, he moves in and out, he fights at a distance, he has, like, that karate long Taekwondo stance, and uh, and he's dangerous, he's lethal, you know, and uh, he's tricky, too, so... You know, like like I said, I, when I fought him, I mean, I thought I won the fight, but it was in Mexico City in his hometown, a fight I wish I, you know, could run it back and, or at least in a place where they weren't a little bit on his side and cheering his name. So it was 30,000 Mexicans screaming his name, you know, and, uh, but we had a good fight. It was a fight of the night. It was a war. You know, I lost my school decision, but, you know, I definitely want to want back. And I do have to earn my way up there. You know, I'm looking to extend my winning streak. I just came off a win of Justin James and, you know, hopefully I can take out Jamin Jackson uh, next week and uh, you know continue my streak and get to the top and you know hopefully maybe get a, if he's a champ at the time or wherever he is you know I'm sure I'm gonna have to pass him one way or another I'd love that rematch yeah before we get into the fight like you mentioned Damon Jackson I wanted to ask you about your history the history of your family man because it's it's an interesting story of your father Chucky your grandfather and your uncle were all professional boxers explain to me the environment of of that growing up, you know, were you in the gym? Were you in the boxing gym all the time? Or were you just like doing your own thing? So my grandfather was a Navy boxer. So like, and then my uncle Tommy was a tough man champion, you know, multiple time tough man champion through New England, all over the country. Um, he has over 200 fights and, and my father boxed too. And the thing is with all of them, my grand and none of them were ever made a professional career out of it and made it their job because all of them had families and kids and responsibilities. Like, my grandfather had nine kids. You know, I have nine aunts and uncles on one side. My, my uncle Tommy has five daughters, you know, five daughters. And my dad had six kids, you know what I'm saying, one including me. So they had other responsibilities, financial responsibilities and things that, you know, I respect him for a lot because I might not be here if my pops was a professional boxer, like, and, you know, pursued that because, you know, that it obviously got mouths to feed, so they got other responsibilities. And, um, you know, he made sure he put food on the table for us and did what he did by working. So that's something I respect a lot about my family. And, you know, I think that's why, you know, fighting's in my DNA. It's in my blood. But maybe so many people haven't heard about, you know, but I know every single one of them. If they did what I did and had the opportunity that I had, every single one of them would have been great. And you would, you know, they'd be telling stories about them. But, you know, that's that's only he said, she said. But I just, from what I see, like my, my pops is like in just as good a shape as me. Like every morning he gets up. An hour and a half, dude. He's on the he's on the rowing machine, like the pulling thing. He's going like as hard as he can. Like he's, I'm like, and he's like, man, he's almost 60 years old now, man. Like, and it's crazy to see him. He runs on the beach still. He runs his weights in his hand. He's been doing it ever since I was a little kid. I remember I used to run in his boots, and he used to take bricks, and he used to run down the street. So I remember, you know, he'd always have me doing push-ups. So like, I come from a fighting family. You know, fighting's definitely in my DNA, and. uh you know, my, my Uncle Tommy was probably the most, is, you know, he just fought. He's he's 50-something years old. And after my fight with Justin, I flew to um, Pennsylvania with him. And he won, a, you know, an, another tough man, um, a Masters Division boxing match. He knocked the guy out. Damn. It was pretty amazing to be in his corner. I don't know if he saw 
detail, but I walked out with him. It was like really special. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, it was funny cause I got him a belt, like a championship belt to, to so when he, when he won, I could give him presented to him for having over 200 fights in his career. Cause like, you know, he does all these fights, but he, he gets like, he's fighting heavyweights. He's putting weights in his pants to make weight. It's crazy what, what he does. It's like, and, you know, when, when he won, he's like, how did you know, how did you know I was going to win? I was like, I knew you were going to win, you know, because he doesn't win all of them, you know what I'm saying? He's not like an undefeated, you know, he, he goes in there and he fights guys that are younger than him. He's fighting like 35, 40 year old guys that are 30 pounds heavier than him. He, do, he doesn't care. He just does it because he loves it now. But it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. But yeah, man, fighting's in my DNA for sure. Two is I got my little brother, Lucas Rosa. He's no undefeated amateur. So he's living down in South Florida training with me too. So He's a future superstar in the making. I was going to ask you next is like, do do your family members live through you? Because you're at the highest level competing, you know what I mean? And and that's all you can ask for as a family family member is to. But you got your uncle fighting at 60 years old, man. Like, I guess he inspires you, right? <laughs> yeah, no, he inspires me more than anybody. I feel like he really does. Like, he's the, you know, I, I, I tell him that all the time. When I'm having tough times and I'm like, oh, man, I'm nervous about this, this. And he's like, he always tells me, man, enjoy the ride. Like, you got to enjoy it. This is the best time of your life. Like, enjoy these moments because you're living the dream right now. He's like, you're doing what I wanted to do, what your dad wanted to do, what your grandfather probably all of them really wanted to do. They just had other responsibilities. So, man, I, I definitely, you know, am, am blessed to be able to make a living off of this. You know, I mean, I used to go to the gym when I first started. You know, I didn't know I was going to be a fighter or whatever, but I used to have to pay $150 a month for two or three years in the beginning just to go train in an MMA gym. And like, I'd pay the dues every month and I was broke then. I only had a bicycle. I didn't have any car. I didn't, didn't even have a cell phone for the first like six months I was training. So, uh, yeah, like when I met Charles McCarthy, so like I always paid my dues. I always did it. But now the fact that I could do something that I used to pay to do and get paid to do it, that's like the ultimate dream come true. And I feel like that's for anybody. Like if you could, I mean, you've done probably so many of these interviews are free, but if you could get, on like ESPN where Ariel's at making millions of dollars doing this, like that's the ultimate dream. And you know, it's definitely possible because if I did it and you know what I'm saying? I feel like it's just hard work and just staying with it and, you know, keeping loving the passion for it, you know, besides the, the hard work and the passion for fighting, what else did you get from your uncle or your, your father that has taken you this far in your career? Yeah, that, that's a good question because uh, there's a good answer too. Is that you know the one thing that I was always raised from my dad ever since I was a little kid was you know I played hockey. I was a triathlete, hockey, lacrosse, football, but hockey mainly is is, is to never give up. You know, so like if we're losing the game six nothing and it's a third period and like I'm out there just people just dangling around, not really trying. They kind of know the game's over. Like I'm hustling. Like if I'm not hustling, my dad's gonna be pissed. So like I just remember that. Like he would get more mad about stuff like that. If I scored two or three goals, like or a hat trick in a hockey game, he, he would be happy. You know, he'd be like, "Oh, good, good job." But he would be more good job, like, "Oh, I saw you hustling out there at the end. I saw that you didn't, you know, you scored that goal at the end of the game, even though you were down. Team was down six nothing. You still the only one skating out there, like. So that's kind of what really, like, you know, I was instilled at a young age. And same with school. Like, if I if I came home with a you know a D or a C or a bad grade, it wasn't as big of a deal as long as I was trying hard, or giving up all my maximum effort. But if I had like a B, but it said like lax effort, like he'd be pissed. So these are little things that I was instilled in me. You know, luckily I had a good family, a good dad, and he taught me good values and good lessons and, you know, told me to work hard and, you know, he, he never let me dog it. You know what I'm saying? So those are things that I definitely instilled in me at a young age. And that that's kind of like that fighter mentality from my dad. And, you know, like, even though, like I said, he didn't get to have the career he wanted being a boxer, man. If you ever met him, you'd know right away, man. He's a, he's a beast. <laughs> for sure and speaking of beasts you know your younger brother lucas you mentioned him earlier he's six and oh now as an amateur what is your involvement with his career man i'm heavily involved i've cornered him in every single fight except for the one when i went with my uncle tommy and uh that was actually his best fight he won in like 17 seconds so i was like dude what are you doing with tommy? <laughs> but no nah, man i i i've been helping him along the way man like uh he was a state champion wrestler from new hampshire so he had that like that wasn't anything that I did for him. He earned that himself. But I think that he probably saw a little bit of the success in my career and was like, man, like, this is pretty cool. Like, you get to, you don't have to go to a nine to five job every day and do something you don't like and sit. You know, he's a philosophy major. He graduated from college, like, smart, smart kid, always good grades. 
but I think he realized like he didn't want to be sitting in front of a computer just doing, you know what I'm saying? Like working for somebody else. And he saw like my life. That's what I'm guessing. I mean, I don't really ask him too much about it, but I'm sure that's what it is. And, you know, to be able to see that, you know, you can, you can do something you love and make a living out of it. That's the real dream. Like we said before, but yeah, man, I help him every single day. He helps me too. Like earlier the other day, he was, you know, my, my sparring partner moving around, you know, kicking and, you know, luckily for me, we've been able to have a gym, American combat gym that we just opened up and been able to get him the best coaches in the world. I mean, he has a world champion, Muay Thai coach, Gregory Choplin, you know, UFC fighter, obviously me as a brother, like helping him, Charles McCarthy, UFC veteran, submission specialist, black belt jiu-jitsu, and like, man, the list goes on of this guy's coaches. Like, you know, he's, he's a state champion wrestler, Matt Wagg, he's a wrestling coach. Like, he has so many guys he has a better setup than I had. So like, I mean, I, I have high expectations for him. I expect him to be great, you know, and uh, I think he has all the tools and the blueprint for me to do it. When I looked at your last couple of fights and I realized that ahead of your last fight against Justin James, I believe you made some changes, right? And you actually started going to Sanford. You know, I know Sanford and American Top Team, they're the two biggest giants in MMA you guys are all concentrated in the same area which is crazy to me but um how did that all happen how did you realize or not realize but how did you get into just going over to Sanford while still being at ATT yeah so I was in ATT and I was there for I'd say 11 years my entire career since I was an amateur and my coach Charles McCarthy was too and you know he fought as in the UFC through there and you know I still have a great outstanding relationship with Dan Lambert and all the guys you know friends with Mazadal, all those guys, I still see him out when I go to the fights and stuff and, you know, you know, see him around and uh, all the all the fighters there I'm good with. But it came to a point, you know, during me going there and, you know, I, I always had my coach Charles McCarthy, you know, and he always had an American top team. And after coronavirus and all this stuff that was happening, Charles no longer had an American top team. He changed the gym to American combat gym to not have to deal with all the, the issues with it. You know what I'm saying? Like the whatever, like he kind of just went off on his own. So there, there was no bad blood between him and the, the top team, but they just, you know, top team started really stricken their rules of who was allowed in the gym, who, where you could go train off time. Like they're telling me, oh, you can't go to this gym to train jujitsu. You can't work on your boxing with this code. You can't do these things. And I'm like, listen, man, this is mixed. You know, I told them, I said, this is, I've done the same thing for 11 years, my whole career. This is mixed martial arts. Like if you're telling me that I can only train one spot, one place to limit my learning and my ability, like, I, that's not okay with me. And, they're like, Charles, it's nothing. We love you. But, like, this is our new policy, especially with coronavirus. Like, we don't want people training in other places. And I was like, you know, I shook, shook Dan Lambert's hand. I said, no, I appreciate it. Like, I'm not going to, you know, go lie and say I'm not training in other places. I said, no, I, I'm a mixed martial artist. Like, I want to learn. I want to evolve this sport. I want to teach people. I want to teach my little brother. I want to grow in the sport and uh you know i had to leave american top team because of that and uh like i said like i still have a good relationship with them there's no bad blood but it was just a decision that i feel like i had to make at the time because i didn't want to limit my learning and my abilities and um you know henry hoof you know so obviously like you i want to still be training at the highest level and um you know henry hoof uh welcomed me with open arms i had a great relationship with him my kickboxing coach from holland was good friends with them stefan birkenpass and them they trained in holland together and you know, Sean Story, I don't even know I fought him. We're from the same area. We're boys now. And, man, I've been able to get some great work in there. They have the highest level guys, and it's just like an American top team. But, you know, the same level, and it's uh, it's exactly what I need. It's kind of like the, the analogy of it's the same juice, just a different flavor. Yeah, same, different flavor. And it's like, you know, it's like I said, like the sport is called mixed martial arts. So anytime somebody limits your ability to mix it up and to learn – then it's kind of like, what are you doing? You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you, you need to evolve in the sport. You need to learn. And, uh, you know, I've always paid my gym dues everywhere I went. I've always, you know, so, like, you know, the, it's, it's difficult. You know, they, they, you know, the American top team use the analogy to me. They're like, oh, you know, Charles, if you're playing on the Seattle Seahawks, like, you're not going to go practice with the New England Patriots, are you? And I'm like, yeah, but you guys aren't paying me $20 million a year. I, I'm I, I, you guys, like, I'm paying you guys, like, to train here. So why can't I go anywhere else? And it didn't make much sense to me, but, you know, it's just becoming a little more corporate, their style, and it, there's, it is what it is. But uh, that's, that's, that's an, it's the name of the game. And like I said, Henry Hooft and the Sanford guys have opened me with walking open arms. They're a good family atmosphere there, good people, solid team, and, uh, you know, good structure, you know. So uh, 
I'm getting all the work in I need there, the hard wrestling, and then I get to go, you know, work on my fine-tuning skills like the boxing and jujitsu, the techniques, and um, you know, so my skills, my, my skills building, and can keep it up. Completely understandable. You seem like you found a, a great combination. Now let's talk about Damon Jackson. Why does he yeah. make sense for your next opponent? Why did you just de- Why did you decide to sign the contract? Because you know sometimes you have to kind of look at the matchups and say, will this guy take me to the next fight that I want? You know? No, that, it, this is a fight. You know, you look at it and um, yeah, Damon Jackson. He, he's a formidable opponent, and there's no easy fights in the UFC. So when they they ask you who you want to fight, like I I, I pretty much I've never declined a fight. I mean, they, they, I was supposed to fight Volkanovski like five years ago in Germany, and I signed the contract, and you know the fight never went through for whatever reason. I don't know if it was an injury in his part or whatever, but man, I've never turned down a fight from the UFC. And you know I'm smart enough and much enough of a veteran now that if they offer me a fight, it doesn't make sense. But at the end of the day, I'm gonna have to beat all these guys, and if I can't get through Damon Jackson, then how am I going to get through, you know, to be the champion? And that's my ultimate goal. I'm not here for a paycheck. I'm not fighting in the UFC just for a paycheck or just, you know, to be like, oh, I'm in the UFC or to get a couple wins and just, like, you know, stick around. Like, I'm here to be the champion. And if I ever feel like there's a point that I can't be the champion, which means that I'd have to be the best guy in the division and beat every guy in the division, then, you know, I'm not in the right place. So I'm going to look to continue my winning streak and, you know, climb up the ladder and, you know, hopefully get – you know, big fight, and, you know, like I said, if I have to get through Ye or Rodriguez, who I feel like I already beat, then it is what it is, but, uh, you know, that's my ultimate goal, and I, and I know I got the skills. I mean, I don't make, like, any excuses, like, you know, like, when I've lost my fights, like, oh, what happened? Like, are you, but, like, you know, I fought Derek Miner, I had literally broken thumb. Like, I got surgery after the fight, like, it's fine now, it feels great, but I fought him with no thumb. Like, I remember when I went for an arm bar on him in the first round, I grabbed his arm and my thumb just went whoop backwards and I was like, oh man, this is not, and I'm trying to fight his grips to get his takedowns and get up and I'm pushing on his head and my thumb just going backwards every time and I'm like, man, there's this something wrong here, like, I'm not going to quit, you don't see me quit, I'm going to fight through the end and, you know, I don't like to make excuses, I don't want to steal any of the glory from Derek, you think he's an animal, but that's a fight I'd like to have back too, I know, you know, I beat him nine out of ten times, just the name of the game. And, um, you know, it, it is what it is. But uh, I think, you know, after that fight, I did work particularly a ton on my wrestling because after my neck injury, I stopped wrestling so much. Like, I was like, oh, I don't want to hurt my neck again. Like, I didn't really trust it. So I just did a lot of stand-up, a little bit of jiu-jitsu, and just, like, focused on my stand-up. But then I realized, like, man, I can't be training for UFC fights as a kickboxer. Like, I'm not doing a kickboxing match, doing a UFC fight. And I learned that after I lost to minor. So, you know, I, I'm bouncing back. My wrestling's back. I'm working every day, drilling, hand fighting, you know, breaking grips and things that, you know, I've always known, but I just it didn't keep sharp a couple of those fights. So now I'm sharpening those blades back up. You know, the, the trading of the wins and losses, you know, the, the trend that you have created for yourself, does that ever, you know, stick in the back of your mind, like throughout camp or even during a fight? Yeah, I think like, oh, you win, you win one, I lose one. I mean, I'm trying to win everyone. It's not like there's anything, you know, there's things that come into play. I mean, the first three losses of my UFC career were all fight of the night. So like you watch any fight of the night fight, you know that the judges could call that either way. So I don't really feel like, I mean, I've really been like defeated, you know, and even I have a TKO loss to Shane Burgos. But man, I was, I smoked him the first two rounds. I was up on the judges scorecards. He hit me with a good shot in the third. I rolled out of it and was swinging, and the ref jumped in prematurely. So, like I said, like I don't like to make excuses like for these fights and these things, but it's for me in my head. Like I know mentally, if like a little bit of luck is involved. Sometimes it's like you get one or two of those split calls, or you know, you don't fight injured, or you make make better decisions, or little things can happen, or you know, like during the fight that it just takes a little bit of that and it's uh, right to the top, you know. So. You look at even guys like Dustin Poirier, Charles Oliveira, guys. These guys have multiple losses in the UFC, many losses, but all of them are champions, you know, and uh, have been champions or currently champions or right in the running still. So, um, you know, they didn't start there. They had to work their way up. So I feel like I'm just maturing as a fighter, you know, even though I'm a little bit older than some of the other fighters in the roster. Like, I started late at this. Like, I didn't make my, you know, I didn't. I didn't start training MMA till I was like 23, 24, where some of these guys, you know, were starting when they're like, you know, kids. So I think I, you know, finally got the skills now. And now my body's, you know, I was a little bit of a, I matured a little bit late. Like I still, you know, got hair in my chest now and I'm, you know, ready to ass. So I'm ready to go. Definitely, man. And, and 
breaking the trend, man. How do you see yourself breaking that trend against Damon Jackson? Oh, I'm so excited about it, man. That's the thing. Like, I really, I really want to get this two in a row because once you know how it goes, two in a row turns into three, turns into a main event, turns into a title shot. So, you know, I see myself, you know, winning this fight, maybe getting another big fight in Boston in front of the crowd, continuing my, you know, all time win streak in Boston, and then a main event fight, and then, you know, go for the champ. So, um, you know, I got it mapped out in my head, and but I see Damon Jackson, man. I, you know, he's a person in the way of my goals and my title. And, you know, I see, you know, his, his chin's been checked a few times. You know, I've yet to score a knockout in the UFC. And, um, you know, I've seen he's been slept like three or four times unconscious. So I think if I can find his chin, um, he, he's going to have a long night. Or, you know, it might be his neck if he wants to try to shoot in and wrestle on me. I mean, I, I've been, been working on that a lot. And I'm fighting grips and hand fighting. And uh, it'll be a long night for him if he wants to, you know, try to wrestle. Because I'm one of the best submissions, you know, specialists in the, in, in the division I think I, I really believe that. I mean, you look at all the attempts I have, and the one against Derek, I really feel like I would have got Derek out of there if I could have just caught him and, you know, something. But he just, uh, my thumb wasn't letting me do it. So I, I, I think I got the skills to submit him too. So wherever the fight goes, I think I'm the better fighter. One last thing before I let you go. The biggest news from last weekend, there was so much going on, like the Hall of Fame and the, the, the UFC 266 incredible fights. But the biggest thing was John Jones getting arrested in Las Vegas. Uh -huh for alleged domestic violence and attacking a police car, headbutting a police car, which was pretty crazy to... When you heard the news, what, what is your take on this whole situation and the John Jones saga? It's tough, man. I mean, I, I, mean, I know John Jones personally. You know, I've been, I've, I've been with him in Vegas after a couple of his wins, and he's always treated me with a lot of respect. You know, I mean, um, he's, he's, a, he's great. He's, he's positive. I've never seen the bad side of him, but, you know, everybody has that, like, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, you know, sometimes alcohol gets involved and you make bad decisions, and I feel like everybody that's ever drank alcohol has made bad decisions now. Is it to the level of John Jones where he's, you know, headbutting police cars? I, I don't know, but I think his issue isn't necessarily as much as it is John Jones as it is, like, maybe a substance abuse problem or, or, or you know, alcohol dependency, so that's, like, really where I feel like the underlying issue is for him. And, you know, it's not, doesn't mean it makes it excusable that he's doing any of these things. It just like means that he needs to focus. Like, people don't like really look at it. Like it's not, John Jones as a person isn't a bad person. It's just the decisions he's making when he's under the influence are bad decisions. And I think everybody makes bad decisions, but to what extent, you know, so that's kind of how I feel on that. Yeah, definitely. I completely agree, man. It's just, uh, it's sad to see. You know, it's sad to see something like that yeah. happen to somebody in in our sport, man. It's our sport. Like we yeah. we watch well, it, we breathe it, we we love it. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of it. I mean, all the bad decisions I've ever made in my life, they usually start with something like that, from alcohol or drugs or something bad. You know what I'm saying? It's never like, oh, I'm having a regular day. I mean, a couple of times I almost had to get out of my car and whip someone's ass. And, but besides that, like, <laughs> I'm usually good, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I had my nights, man, for sure. Now. <laughs> October 9th, UFC Fight Night Las Vegas. Thank you, Charles, so much for the time, man. I love speaking with you and always kind of delving into different aspects of you, and, and you're always open. Thank you so much, and uh, have a great fight. Oh, I appreciate you, man. I just want to give a shout-out to my new sponsor. I'm the new sponsor, uh, Canico. You know, it's um, it's great. You know, for me, it's been keeping me through camp. And also, if you guys want to check out Chucky's Fight, um, it's a it's charity. My dad's charity where he goes and jumps in the freezing cold ocean every day. Uh, well, it's summertime, you know, but... Uh, freezing cold ocean to get you know to help raise money for substance abuse and stuff like that so a lot of the money goes and helps kids out that are struggling and uh yeah man definitely tune in october 9th and watch me uh, whoop uh damon jackson